My name is Leonard Paul. I run the School of Video Game Audio. If you want to check out the details, it's SOVGA.com. And today I'm joined by Nathan Moody, and it's awesome to have him with us to answer your game audio questions. And as usual, I don't really give much of an introduction. So yes, um, once you're finished, that's it, Nathan. <laughs> Please do a small introduction on what you've been up to and your sort of path in game audio up until this point. Uh, over the next, uh, yeah, you know, basically like a few minutes, just a, just a, an intro. That'd be great. You bet. Uh, so I grew up on the East Coast of the United States, and I was an art kid. And I went to um, school to study illustration. And when I went to university, I wound up really loving the computer as a medium. Uh, and so that got me into doing some work in video production. So I worked at a video production house for a while. Uh, my first media job was being a video editor. And then from there, I wound up doing uh, motion design and did a little stint in visual effects. And then I got into interactive. Um, and I wound up being an interaction designer for many years. And throughout all of the projects I worked on, whether they were websites or CD-ROMs back in the day, or mo more recently, interactive installations, was always the person either managing the audio process or doing it myself. And so when I had an opportunity to kind of rethink how I was going to spend, how I wanted to spend my working days, I looked back at my career and realized, oddly enough, across all of those different strange disciplines, I was always like the audio person. And so that kind of set me on a path to uh, work more specifically in and around audio. And I started that journey first through the music industry. Uh, I've been a musician for 20, 25, well, my whole life, but I've been releasing albums for 20 or 25 years. And I just wound up connecting with a bunch of people in the San Francisco Bay Area music scene, which is where I live. And I never considered myself that technical until I started hanging out with and collaborating with a lot of uh, other musicians. And one of them out of the blue asked if I wanted to try mastering one of his al ambient albums, which I did. And it went so well uh, that that album happened to become like one of the Bandcamp like top ambient releases that year, just out of coincidence. Nice. And that coincidence opened up the floodgates and I became a professional mastering engineer. Uh, but through that and also through all the other lives that I've lived professionally, I've always been an avid field recordist and sound designer. So I've done a lot of UI interfaces for actual interfaces for everything from consumer electronics prototypes to interactive installations in museums. And uh, I wound up really wanting to get into games, not only because of my love of the medium, but because unlike traditional linear post-production, the devil I knew and the workflow I was much more comfortable with was software development, having been an interaction designer uh, and experience designer for many years. So uh, I started doing some work in that uh, regard and worked on a few indie games. And then uh, the opportunity come up, came up after I took a class at the School of, Vi uh, School of Video Game Audio in WISE. Uh, the opportunity came up to uh, start working with Skywalker Sound. And so that's what I've been uh, doing and has been keeping me busy for the last year or so. Oh, that's cool. That's a great overview. I know that it can be tricky <laughs> to basically uh, cram everything into a short period of time, but it's great because we want to be able to get to as many questions as possible. And uh, yeah, I guess as far as my own, you know, meeting you uh, we we do uh sort of sound checks and so you know we chatted a little bit yesterday and one of the things that i thought was really um you know exceptional about you is that you have a very open mindset and that's great for not just learning new skills but also like you know connecting and networking and that kind of thing and so when you know working with you at the school it was great to be able to you know hear all your questions but then also see how you synthesized and like you know basically assimilated that feedback into your own way so that it would you know reinforce the presentation that you had which was really 
like awesome to see and so that's <laughs> part of the reason oh, that thank you. you ended up being a featured grad as well so yeah yeah it, um i think one of the reasons why i've had this very non-linear career path is just i'm i'm kind of obsessively curious about everything and uh that helps with meeting new people or trying to learn a new skill or even trying to adopt a different kind of workflow um and so i always love to give new things a try and and see if it sticks and i think that um one of the things that i've happened to have benefited from from having this weird career and work, worked in a bunch of different fields is that when i'm on a uh, i'm on a game audio team i can communicate to almost everyone in every department in their language mm. so i've written code hated it and um <laughs> decided i would never write another line of code again but i know what's easy i know what's hard uh i know all about object-oriented uh programming and and you know pattern reuse and um and when someone explains to me how a system works that's much easier for me to understand. Um, and I'm very sensitive to issues of user experience, as you might imagine, uh, especially as it pertains to how audio can can uh, influence user experience and uh, smooth interactions. Um, so I think that that's something that I've certainly didn't des design consciously in my career, but I think right. that that's where, you know, being a generalist, uh, my my whole career has kind of helped me uh connect with people in other disciplines more more easily i think yeah yeah i think that that's uh super important my background thanks but it is encoding <laughs> and for me uh that's how i sort of you know that's my <clears throat> university background i went for you know sort of the traditional route there but also yeah like i did that primarily because I was okay with, you know, like doing coding stuff. And I was like, fine. So it's like, yeah, this, this is not too bad. And with the school, I also support, you know, basically all the student projects, which is, you know, it's a fair amount of work to make sure that like, you know, the 3D game kit and the other stuff, you know, the, all the, you know, Unreal projects and Unity projects continue to run. Uh, and I think it would have been, yeah, tricky to basically sort of contract that kind of stuff out. But I totally understand what you're saying about, you know programming and it's if it's a fit that's great but then if it's not a fit it is still good to learn the language enough to go like yeah you know like i can basically yeah connect and communicate in an effective manner with the people that are going to be helping me out on that side of things which is you know kind of essential you well not essential but it's very helpful for when working in game audio yeah definitely i mean even even if you you don't wind up writing code professionally i think even just the idea of knowing the difference between public and private variables and get versus set and all of those um all of those things that uh you don't have to write but are exposed to in say unreal blu blueprints um where that logic is still going to uh have a certain flow in order to then be compiled behind the scenes into actual code and so the more kind of high even high level knowledge one has about that stuff the better yeah cool well i guess i'll start out with a question but i know that i'm pointing over here this is the youtube screen where there's like people you know whatever online and stuff and i'm trying to you know say hello and all that kind of stuff at the same time as chatting but uh my leading question which is sort of you know to basically put the frame on things in your most recent activities within games is yeah like skywalker sound i'm very interested to hear sort of you know i know you can talk you know in depth about things but maybe you can give sort of a vibe of what it's been like sort of from your transition of you know finishing up your reel to starting to work at a company like that and how that might be possible for other people, but also just more so just like your own path. It's, it's, I'm sure a lot of people are curious about that. Yeah. Uh, when people hear about Skywalker sound, I think people instantly think about uh, film post-production and, and uh, series post-production. Uh, and we do have a small interactive team. And uh, we are that team has worked a lot with ILM X Lab, which is their kind of uh, interactive new next generation uh, experience group. Uh, but I've also worked on third party projects through Skywalker Sound. So a bunch of us were uh, just 
uh, this year came off of working with a bunch of other uh, vendors as well as the internal team on uh, the Callisto protocol. Um, so that was a very big AAA project. Uh, and since then, I'm, I've been uh, moved over to some other new projects, which are all very exciting. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's uh, one of the nice things about where I live, which again, I'm in Northern California, I'm San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And just the, the, the audio community up here is just so, so kind of mutually supporting, you know, it's, we're, we're outside of the sphere of some other markets where they can be very uh, competitive and uh, people are really kind of out, kind of trying to just raise their own flag. And it's, yeah. it's really amazing to be at a place where everyone kind of wants the, wants the institute, institute, wants their work to elevate the institution. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, someone's personal glory. And that makes it just like, you know, really collegial and incredibly warm and welcoming. And, uh, and it's been an amazing experience so far. Yeah, well, that's a core reason for me to start the school, you know, <laughs> uh, almost a decade ago that uh, I really wanted to sort of plug a bit of a gap that I saw between sort of conventional, like, you know, go to university, get a game job kind of thing. And for people that, you know, wanted to sort of pick things up and fit them into their schedule where it kind of fit. And uh, yeah, I'm very interested in sharing sort of the information that I have, but then also like building a community so that we can talk to each other and having Discord is great. And you're active on our Discord, which is super awesome. Obviously, we've got uh, our uh, TA, uh, that's Jordan and Grant that helps out. And so he's actually, uh, uh, watching live right now, which is cool. He might be in and out just to say, <laughs> he's, you know, everybody needs to work. So it's kind of like we, we grab people when we can, but yeah, like having talented folks like them. And then also, uh, Viviana Caro, she marks, um, basically gives feedback on projects for the wise course, the first, um, sort of four projects and same thing for the FMOD course as well. So this idea of sharing is is super huge. And I think that some people are really astounded when they move into game audio and they're just like, wow, why is everybody sharing so much? Like, this is bizarre. Like, I don't have this, you know, sharp, yeah. sh sharp sh shoulder or elbows kind of vibe that I do with my last kind of like, you know, area that I used to work in. So yeah, this is something that you know, the community has worked on over years because like, say a while ago, it was definitely not the case. It was more sort of the big boys kind of thing. And we are really actively trying to make it more inclusive so that we get a diversity of like opinions and stories and content and games and art out of it. So yeah, this sharing is like a super core uh, part of what I think is, you know, makes this industry really uh, special. Um, yeah. yeah. And I can, I, can, I can speak through my diverse background that I can guarantee you very, very, very few other industries are as open and sharing <laughs> as, uh, yes. as game audio. But I, I think a lot of it is just because the, the state of the art is constantly changing. And every single mm -hmm. project, you know, you can look at people who have mountains and mountains of experience and every single one of them sits down to a new project and is just like, I have no actual idea how we're going to get this done. Like yeah. there's a, there's, there's, and that's where the excitement comes from, right? Like you don't want to be so underwater that you can't get a breath, but if the water level's right here and you got to yeah. tread water a little bit, like that's where all the good learning is going to come from. That's where the hard work's going to come from. That's where the innovation is going to come from. And I think because everyone's kind of still figuring it out on every project, no matter what I, that's everyone just has this spirit of like, no, no, I don't have this figured out, but here's what I tried. We think it worked or here's what we tried and it didn't work. So don't waste your time. And there's this kind of, uh, you know, rising tide floats all boats kind of attitude, which, uh, I, which was more prevalent in society in general. <laughs> Yeah, well, you've uh, you've found a good spot with us. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, you know, it's uh, I've been doing this since the mid '90s, and it's been it's been interesting. You know, as far as the transition from the way things were back then to where they are right now, and you know, there's still a lot of things to sort of you know work on and whatnot. But uh, yeah, we're doing what we can. I'll uh, ask you a question already that we have from. Uh, from our viewers here, uh, the question being, what was the interview slash hiring process to join 
Skywalker sound. Hmm. Uh, it was it was unusual in that um, I was I was contacted uh, by somebody I didn't know who worked there. Um, yeah. And so that kind of took me by surprise. And I, I have to admit, I did some searching on LinkedIn to make sure this person was actually who they said they were. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, that doesn't know. What, really? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that was just simply the result of a, of a few things. And um, that was a result of me uh, being fairly consistent and kind of putting out into the universe what I wanted to do and what I enjoy mm -hmm. doing. Um, being naturally curious and always trying to meet new people and uh, sharing my work with other people to tell me how I can improve. And that's, that's how I network. You know, I don't go to conferences and do the finger guns and wink and point, you know, it's like, right. who here is interesting, who has a different perspective than I do and what can I learn from them? And yeah. can we laugh over having a beer and like that's yep. that or, or a coffee and like that's what I like in a person, you know? Yes. And so just that natural, uh, that natural process kind of over years, many, many years. <laughs> yeah. Started in 1879 for me. <laughs> yeah. Man. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, that, that just snowballed into finally people talking to other people who were at Skywalker Sound and said like, you ever talk to Nathan? Maybe he'd be a good fit. I don't know. And then, um, uh, of course, the a really big part of it was actually the reel I made out of, coming out of my uh, Wise class at uh, School of uh, Video Game Audio. Oh, cool. uh, that was that was not the door opener. That was kind of like the that's what caused the the doorbell to ring. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, but after that, the interview process was was really smooth, and everyone was super nice, and just talked to the hiring like like this is true. I think of almost everywhere. You know, talk to hiring manager first, uh, talk to a broader cross-section of the team to make sure there's kind of a shared ethos in terms of how work will get done. Um, and uh, yeah, it didn't take long for me to start slot, get slotted in on, on my first uh, actual project. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, it's interesting because <laughs> as far as for people overall, the there's no, there's no quick you know, an easy way kind of like into these things, you know, mm -mm. there's a, there's a reason why there's sort of a pedigree with, you know, Skywalker sound in particular and, you know, those things. Um, yeah, it's, it is interesting that basically it's by invite. I mean, I guess some people, you know, they might put out calls for people and stuff as well. There's obviously different avenues into it, but it's very interesting to hear about your process as well. Cause, uh, yeah. And it's yeah, it's it, not that different than how I fell into mastering. Yeah. You know, gathering, you know, finding a community that I I just grooved with and and enjoyed engaging with. And then all of a sudden someone asked me to effectively do them a favor, and that turned into like this whole other big thing. Um and so I think for me a lot of it's just kind of like find where the good people are and engage with them in just honest, legitimate, friendly conversation and learn from each other and you know just be super genuine as to who you are and i think that's another thing where uh, like a lot of people have you know kind of put on game face when they go into interviews or they write a cover yeah. letter in a certain way and it's just like if you pretend to be someone that isn't exactly authentically who you are and you get hired as that other person <laughs> yeah that's a that's your that's a bad way to start off uh on the wrong foot and get uh, really misaligned expectations. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if, if you're like, I want to work with a bunch of super weirdo freaks who are yeah. as weird and freaky and strange as I am. Yeah. That lead with that, because that's going to get you <laughs> into the right, the right work tribe. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think a, a lot of us, a lot of us for better and worse, really tie up our self worth into our work product because we're creative professionals. And, that allows us to sink a lot of passion into it, but then we can also get wounded, you know, with withering critique or, or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think people just need to remember that, like, we're all trying to uh, work in this really interesting, uh, stimulating environment that is game audio. 
but that's only part of our lives. You know, it's yeah. work. And we want to sink a lot of our self-worth into that. And I don't think that's avoidable. I think that's how we do good work. Um, but I think it's really about making sure that you you don't have to feel like your work life is your family. Like right. if you if you stumble into that and you find that, amazing, super amazing. But I think for me, what I look for isn't workplace culture, it's workplace mm -hmm. ethos. Right. You know, like I don't want to have like a, mo I don't want to work at a place where there's a monoculture of everyone kind of thinks the same. I want to work yeah. at a place where everyone places the same value on the work and has a shared uh, kind of, rubric as to like how work is gets done and what will be successful that's all that matters to me um yeah. and so for for me the uh having a diversity of of thought and opinion like that's that's all i want <laughs> in a in a workplace because that's how i learn that's how i get to be a better person hopefully yeah yeah i think that um when one is you know sort of maybe starting out or even possibly mid-career i think part of what can happen is that if you have yourself wrapped up you know like with your work persona and your own sort of personal persona that when you do either have things that are considered you know like like you know uh setbacks like either not getting a job or a gig that you wanted then it can be this thing of like oh i'm not a good person or blah i gotta like you know whatever like go back to the gym and work out you know like you know whatever wood shedding basically kind of thing mm -hmm. i gotta like level up but a lot of it is, I think a lot of it is just fit. And there's like windows that happen at certain periods of time. And sometimes you can be like knocking at the door for years and it'll never happen. And sometimes, you know, the door will just happen to be open and you end up walking through. And if you're ready, and that's once again, what we try to do at the school is to help prepare people as much as possible so that when those opportunities happen, that you're ready to take the ball and like run with it and be, you know, a contributing member of the team and understand sort of what's going to come up next. And if you don't, how to ask the questions so that, you know, you can survive in those kind of like basically like rapid environments, like, you know, game audio is typically a very fast paced kind of like what's going to go on today kind of like vibe <laughs> it is it is the anti-academia in that way <laughs> like, yeah, yes. you, you, you are not on glacial timelines uh even yeah. when you when you hear about a triple a game that takes years to make it's like every month yeah. there's a whole lot to do yeah uh we have a question related to skywalker but i don't know if this person's ask. let's see oh yes right we have uh CRT asking, what's Grogu really like? Do you happen to know anything <laughs> about Grogu? <laughs> I've not come across Grogu at work. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yes. He seems seems nice. Yeah. Yeah. The, clo the closest I've come is walking by a Yoda statue or two, and that's it. <laughs> nice. And, okay, so there's a related question here. Uh, uh, are you finding varying levels of experience in your colleagues, like at your current workplace mm -hmm. and the other places that you happen to work? I, I think that, uh, across all the places I've ever worked, uh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's what, uh, that's what makes for a good team. Uh, because there are people where. I've worked in situations where I used to joke about this, but now literally I am twice as old as some of the people that I work with. Right. And, um, and I, that's awesome. Yes. That is awesome. Cause the amount of insight they bring is amazing. The, 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 the training they've gotten to get to where mm -hmm. they are is completely different than mine and vice versa. Yep. So there's just so much we can learn from each other. And, uh, I find that in terms of especially, uh, technology and techniques, that's the groups that I work with that um, teach me the most. Yeah. Um, and then there are people who have, uh, 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 I'm trying to think about if I can tell this story, probably not. Um, there are people that I've run into uh, yes. who have been in the industry as long as I've been alive. You know? and, yeah. and like yeah. you get a different kind of learning from them. Um, uh, what, someone I don't work with one-on-one, -on -one, but if you follow, um, uh, the director of sound design uh, at Skywalker, Randy Tom, if you follow him right. on Facebook, he's yeah. just a constant font of fascinating insights and 
not usually about actual sound design. It's about the right. stuff that, that like now I really care about, like client relationships, managing right. how, uh, how to get feedback, how to make sure you're getting the right kinds of feedback, um, issues of collaboration, uh, issues of you're not just a sound person. Why aren't you like interacting with people at the script stage uh, right. where, where you can figure out where sound can really help support the entire experience? And so um, when you find kind of thought leaders like that, uh, and he's only one of them, um, uh, those they're 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 delivering uh, knowledge that is not just tools, tips, and techniques. It's about like being a creative professional yeah. and succeeding at that as a skill. And I think that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky enough to have Randy Tom come up to the Bangor Film School when I was teaching mm -hmm. there. I created the game audio program there, and he got invited up otherwise, but his talk really was focusing on the idea of like total design, where it's just like, yes, audio is part of the process, and we have this unfortunate misnomer of audio post. But, you know, us audio folks would be would love to come into the process earlier. And one of the things that really stuck with me with that talk is that he was like, you know how a lot of films get made is from a script. And a lot of the focus of the script is dialogue because you're typing out text uh, for people to say. But it doesn't necessarily, unless the scriptwriter, you know, the creator at that stage is really focused on trying to balance out different elements he finds that uh, from you know just that natural process that it's very hard to sort of back feed <laughs> like the audio design into mm -hmm. the total design of the particular work so that it fits properly and for me i was just like yeah that that really makes a lot of sense within games we're often, especially if you're in-house, you're brought in a lot earlier so you can, you know, as an audio director or a sound designer or as a musician, sometimes, you know, you can you can help guide the uh, design from the audio side of things, which is really exciting. So it is nice to be brought in earlier in the process. Agreed. So. And there was a great uh, interview with uh, Johnny Burns, who uh, was the sound re-recording mixer and sound designer on uh, Jordan Peele's Nope. And uh, he was saying how Jordan Peele would give him the scripts and they rewrote the scripts five times just based on his input as to how sound should work. And um, yeah, that's a unique case because it's kind of a kind of a horror movie and a lot of the sound cues are off screen. Yeah. And so like if you don't have sound, you're not going to be able to complete that story um but even in something that's very kind of nuanced and kind of grounded in realism like the last of us i mean mm -hmm. there's so much environmental storytelling happening not just in the design of the levels but in the design of the of the soundscape as well and that's that's only possible when those uh disciplines really meet uh, uh meet early and merge around we're all experienced designers it's just that our deliverables are different that's the only yeah. difference and if everyone has that kind of mindset, you can kind of move forward as one cohesive unit. Yeah, definitely. I'll uh, get to some more questions here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. What's the workflow in a professional studio like? Is there a lot of a reiteration of sound design? Hmm. Boy, that depends on the project. Uh, yeah. Some projects really want sounds to be carefully considered and designed, say, against uh, game capture in a linear format in a DAW, and to have a no sound go in unless it's like production ready, proposed, absolute final. And other uh, clients and studios prefer to just kind of get a, that first coat of paint down, all placeholder, yeah. all completely meant to be ripped out and replaced um, as early as possible. So uh, I've seen both ends of that spectrum and everything in between. Um, and I think a lot of it just has to do with, um, has to do with workflow, has to do with um, just kind of expectation management at like the yeah. de department level in terms of who's, re who are the stakeholders reviewing what and what is their ability to interpret early stage work that's placeholder. Um, some stakeholders are really struggle to kind of extrapolate from what they're hearing now into what it could be later on. And that informs one kind of approach. Uh, some stakeholders are just so busy uh, because maybe they've, they're juggling three projects 
that uh, you have to give them like basically final stuff on round one and then you're just you're polishing uh, from, you know, your first deliverable isn't a placeholder, it's proposed final. And then your polish is just making that perfect instead of just making something better iteratively along the way. And I know that Rob Bridget is a big fan of kind of the level one through level four kind of, you know, ramping up in f fidelity, audio fidelity, yeah. um, because uh, almost every other discipline does that. You know, every every level is a gray box. Every level is a white box before it's a gray box. And then every <laughs> level is a gray box before it has textures and lighting. And uh, so I, I naturally like to iterate a lot um and kind of hone constantly towards perfection so that kind of iterative process is just natively how i like to work but how i work on a project just depends on the stakeholders in the team no that's a great answer i'll just quickly say that yeah my my design process is quite iterative as well i like sort of a um uh, yeah, like a feedback, sort of like a natural process, because I find that if I'm sort of off on my own a lot, then I generate stuff that I like, but I really like basically like, you know, because I do music stuff as well, like jamming, you know, like the idea mm. of really collaborating, taking sort of, you know, interesting ideas, like, you know, of course, there's the joke about like, oh, can you make the sound more blue or whatever? And it's just like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, here you go. The sound, is it more blue? I don't know. It's more blue to me. So, you know. Yep. There's uh it it the the underline is is that every project is different depending on you know primarily who's involved and often also like uh, time scale too. Some projects are so short that you just got to fire stuff in there and there's no real time for a lot of review. You know that that uh, <laughs> it's already left the building basically. You like you just got to yeah. get the thing done. So and you know, if if you're a freelancer it. coming into a, a larger studio, that's usually the case. You yeah, they they usually don't hire freelancers until they really need them because the schedule is bearing down. And at that point, like you got to hit really close to the mark on the first try. Yeah. Um, but I think for anyone getting into the industry, looking at a team or looking at a, a, a full time job like these, this is a great set of interview questions to ask the interviewer. You know, it's like like what is the iteration site? What are the iteration cycles here like? And mm -hmm. there's no right. Or, the thing is, like, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just thing to know about that group and is that method of working going to be compatible with you being comfortable and learning yeah yeah definitely um let's see here what has been your experience with advocating for sound or audio within multimedia projects either hmm. i mean i guess i would say this let's just say in general uh because you know yeah, like Skywalker, probably you're fine there, but say maybe with other projects where you're kind of like the audio is something where you do kind of need to sort of, you know, advocate a little bit more for yourself so that, uh, you know, that you're basically that your creative input is kind of like in balance with the overall design. And like you say, the experience of what the product is. Yeah, um, uh, I, I find that on, in my experience, actually, those kinds of insights and being an advocate is is uh almost sometimes more important in the indie scene yeah. than larger projects because with larger projects not all the time but a lot of larger projects people already have that kind of attitude of you know early collaboration because there's the budgets are bigger there's a little bit more time the stakes are higher um but working with indie teams i find that sometimes i need to kind of uh not be uh not be super kind of uh tiptoey around the value right. that that audio can add um and i i did a project last year where it was a public demo super indie game like one developer and uh it was it was a game where it's all about atmosphere mm -hmm. and they were going to launch the demo with basically no level music at all and that wasn't in my scope, but I'm just like, you know what? I'm gonna do this. And yeah. so I basically scored the whole game. <laughs> uh, or, well, the whole game, the demo, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, 15, 20 minutes of gameplay or, or so. And, um, and we had these other conversations about uh, when there are adversaries, you know, uh, how important, uh, just even describing to a, to a uh, developer how important just attenuation is mm -hmm. in terms of just anticipating 
actions that players will need to take in order to survive or meet the level goal or or whatever. Um, so I find that those teams really can benefit and are very receptive to audio kind of coming in and saying, let's reframe the val let's reframe how you think about the value the audio brings. And it's not just see a thing, so you gotta hear the thing. Sometimes you gotta hear the thing before you see the thing. And sometimes what you hear is going to emote all the time. When what you hear before you see the thing is going to emotionally prepare you for what comes next, whether it's combat, going into a new biome, exploration, finding a loot crate, you know, finishing the game, whatever. And so um, I, I find that on indie indie projects, there's always more opportunities to do that. And it's always, I think, more necessary. Nice. I guess one related question is sort of how how one works with critique, both mm. in sort of both of those uh, sort of arenas, both in sort of the AAA, like in your case, sort of on the Skywalker side of things, and then on the indie side of things, because like on the indie side, you might have the, you know, the developer where they have a very set idea or maybe slightly malleable, but they do have an idea of the way that they want it to be, but they might not necessarily have the vocabulary, maybe in audio. Whereas on the flip side, you got, you know, basically you're working on a team, you know, people know a lot about audio. And so how do you find sort of the critique process works in those sort of mm. two, two different scenarios? I think that a lot of people don't realize how much sculpting critique that you get is as important a skill as right. parsing the critiques that are given. So I think that the way to be successful in this is when you submit something for review or you're having a live review with somebody, set expectations as to what someone's hearing, the stage of development it's in, uh, is it proposed final, is it placeholder um if this is an actual meeting put this in the meeting title yeah and then before you play it specifically tell the stakeholders what kind what level of feedback are you looking for what kind of feedback do you need to make mm -hmm. this thing awesome or better and um and i think that's really important because if you don't do that then you're going to get all of these like really radically subjective uh <laughs> Uh, pieces of feedback when really yes. um you know in i think in an ideal world once a game has design pillars everything should fall into those pillars including sound and so if you're working on a horror game and it's got to be scary and gritty and tense you know mm -hmm. every sound should have some balance of those three things if you're working on a farming sim you know maybe the the pillars are are adorable, pastoral, and calming. So every sound should fit into those pillars or reflect those pillars. And then, um, of course, with getting feedback, I hear a lot of people say that you should never kind of push back on feedback. Right. I agree with that, but I think you should push back on unclear feedback. Right. And it's just about engaging in a conversation, not saying like, that makes no sense. What the heck are you talking about? It's, it's, you know, I, I, I hear the point you're making. Let's unpack that. Let's yeah. go a little deeper. Can you clarify what you meant when you said blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, um, I think it's also really important to always to like in the, in the moment, just take notes and triage all of those notes later. Uh, because invariably by the, in the moment, you're not going to know what's going to be higher or lower priority. But at the end of the meeting or upon reflection, I think the priorities are really going to become fairly self-evident. And so uh, I, I've never found that pushing back on scope or amount of feedback in the moment ever does anyone any good. Um, but, you know, stick to your guns and make sure that you hold people's feet to the fire and help them deliver you valuable feedback. That is part of our role is to shape how feedback is given and to clarify feedback enough so that we can go away and say ah i i believe i i see a path forward to execute on that feedback yeah one way sort of jedi mind trick not to mix metaphors but you know <laughs> trick that i've used when working with clients where there's uh you know uh, basically there's like a committee that you're submitting stuff to and sometimes it's very 
um, uh, how do you say, unbalanced when you've got like, you know, a lot of other people giving you feedback and you're the person receiving the feedback. Um, one way that I've tried to focus things uh, sometimes is to kind of uh, frame things where I don't put all my eggs in one basket. I'm sort of, I submit a draft, but I submit a draft sort of like maybe a little bit more on the tent side and then maybe a little bit more on the sort of like, you know, um, I guess you'd say sort of like horror, kind of like maybe gore side or something, you know, like that, with that first example that you gave. So that you have these things that encompass like a little bit of a spectrum. So you're kind of like, you know, you're giving like a frame, a, like a, a gradient that they can kind of go between. Because sometimes... Mm -hmm. Um, if you just submit one thing and you don't need to like basically do twice the amount of work. This is just like at the beginning of the process, say, um, to, to show people that like you're able to adjust to their feedback, but then also that you're still <laughs> working within your, you know, your comfort range. Because sometimes I've had, you know, reviews that go like way off the rails and it's just like that sounds like that should be done by somebody else. That's not really what I'm strong at, but I'll try to do it. So anyways, sometimes, and that's more so with like smaller clients as well. Usually yeah. with larger clients, <laughs> the process is simply more set and they know how uh, best to give like cohesive feedback. And they usually do a review first before talking to you in those kind of things. So yeah, yeah just no, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, I would rather have like the first review be a, a range of options. And then we narrow yeah. like a funnel down to the final asset yeah. uh, because how many times have I been on a project where the thing that I thought was like way outside of the comfort zone, no one expected to hear. And we went with that yeah. just because I had like two things that were super safe and one thing that was completely appropriate and yes. met all of the pillars and design criteria, but was just a little, little bit more orthogonally approached and people love being surprised. And even I if, was gonna, yep. even if they don't like it, they'll be impressed that you went there. And that speaks a lot to your willingness to experiment and take risks. Yeah, and that's, uh, we have a question here. Are there any surprises that you had moving into game audio and Skywalker Sound? Like maybe you had a preconceived idea of what it might be like versus what it actually ended up being like? Hmm. I think one thing people don't talk about, this isn't specific to, to Skywalker Sound, but one thing I think there's not a lot of discussion around is how different game audio aesthetics are from that of film and television. And um, yeah. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not universally true. Um, but, you know, when you have these kind of more Naughty Dog style games, which are really kind of more like interactive cinema, right. um, the, the aesthetics of those two worlds are, are pretty aligned. Um, but when you get into games like Hades or mm -hmm. um, uh, games that are more kind of genre specific, um, yep. there's, there's this... Uh, radically radically kind of over processed over hyped sound that i think a lot of people coming from linear media are can be surprised by um and uh the other the other thing that linear media people are not used to is how loud you print assets i was uh, just gonna say that the <laughs> l1 <laughs> scenario or ott these days yeah yeah oh you can't just use one instance of ott you, you... <laughs> You need three instances of, everywhere. Yeah, you need three instances of OTT and six dispersers. And anyway, um, yes. I'm not saying that's bad, right? Like, yeah, that doesn't make the sounds worse. It just makes the sounds different. And yeah. I think that uh, I would love to see some more scholarly uh, analyses of game audio aesthetics versus film sound aesthetics. I think obviously the two are very related and there's a lot of uh, people who cross both worlds. But I, I, I think there is a palpable difference, uh, which is which is fun to explore. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, have you ever have you worked on your dream project yet? Or if you haven't worked on your dream project yet, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> How many dream projects can I choose? Can I dream uh, a long time? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think my 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 dream is actually working on a variety of projects rather than one dream project. Nice. Um, I would love to go through, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of my life and say like, oh yeah, I was like the sole audio person on this kind of indie project. I was a small cog in a huge machine on this kind of AAA project. Um, I was a, uh, you know, member of a small audio strike team on a 
indie darling game and that was super fun because we were like a little unit and we kind of all shared responsibilities like i would love and this is just kind of how like i said how i learn and why i'm just always constantly curious i think it's much more about my dream is to have all those kinds of experiences working as opposed to those having like a dream project or a dream game specifically uh, because i think that the more you have those broad different experiences the more they start to uh inform one another yeah and you can you can start to innovate on process not just innovate on sound design uh, or technology yeah it allows you to go deeper and then like this you know it seems like a simple word design but you know interaction design experience design you know sound design all these different designs when you really get into it and you approach it like you have from different directions you know it produces a very uh i guess oh and that actually might be part of an answer to your aesthetics uh sort of you know observation about sound design between film and game is that i think it's uh it might be uh and it might be opening up a little bit now but it might be that simply people that are coming into games they used to be have to be more technical and so there was sort of like an inroad there and there was also like you know a certain it's sort of just looking at the characteristics that would produce that kind of like you know um particular sort of result and uh yeah i don't know i think that things are changing now because there's a lot more movement between the two different disciplines or multiple different disciplines if you know there's like theater sound and you know advertising and music and like you know vr and all these things that uh i think it's it's continuing to mix it up and to me you know that diversity of thought is like really a core uh thing that i similarly like look for i i try like you know i just did uh finished up november which is like mm -hmm. working with a bunch of you know whatever blender heads basically like people that work <laughs> in this 3d program this open source 3d program called blender and they make these crazy like things out of like node based like visual scripting and I sort of like, you know, jumped in the mosh pit with like, you know, Unreal Engine 5 <laughs> and did, you know, like I did so focused on sounds like with meta sounds, but then also did like my own, like, you know, whatever shaders as well, like graphics. Mm. And I, I, you know, since I was in university, I've loved doing graphics as well. It's not something, you know, I, I've done some live, you know, like VJ stuff, but it's not something I, uh, you know, I kind of keep that a little bit on the side because I like trying to do different things. Oh, one thing that, um, you know, you, you listed off all the different kind of design disciplines. I, I, I had a, uh, I had a boss and a mentor, uh, who was trained as an architect. And if you ever want to hang around someone who understands capital D design, find people with architecture backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and his mantra that I totally adopted and still follow to this day is everything is a design problem. And if you frame it that way it 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 winds up giving you this framework to be to make more dispassionate decisions and um really trying to figure out if we're if we're going to apply design thinking to everything especially sound then what what are the that's why i keep going back to like design briefs and pillars and like stuff like that that fuels how i think uh when it comes to sound and so like if you don't have those kind of that those mental heuristics kind of in my head, but more importantly, those heuristics are like written out and shared by the whole team. And yeah. there's a consensus around those heuristics for success. Then all of a sudden, when you're getting feedback, uh, it's about like, okay, well, if my sound didn't hit right, this is a design problem. Where am I at? What is, uh, what, what is desired and what's the gap in between? And in that gap in between, it's usually a matrix of skills and time and resources. And then when you start breaking it down like that, it's just like, oh, I can get from point A to point B. That's fine. Thank you for the feedback. Got it. Next, next item. Um, so that's, that's a, been a big benefit. And I think one of the things that we, we're all creatives and to a certain extent, we're all artists, but I think that, you know, really emphasizing the design in the term des sound designer from a process standpoint is, is valuable. Yeah, there's one. For me, uh, my opinion. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I I concur with your opinion with my opinion as well. I second that opinion. <laughs> and you second your my, own opinion? It's my opinion. It's my opinion. <laughs> 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 if 
but it, one of my uh, favorite podcasts is 99% Invisible, and they talk a lot about the design as it sort of, you know, rotates around, you know, architecture. But they bring all sorts of interesting elements of design in there, and it just made me sort of, you know, that that thread made me think of that podcast in particular if people are sort of looking for something there. Um, and we have, uh, as far as our hour mark, we have another 10 minutes left, which is, you know, fine. We don't need to cut it 10 minutes. I think we have plenty of time. Like how you're okay for an extra 15 minutes past the hour. Yeah. Okay. You're yeah. good. Okay, cool. We'll keep going with questions then. Um, uh, so a question should sound redesigns be on my reel as well, or completed games that I've worked on more impressive. Hmm. Boy, that is, that is in the eye of the beholder. And the, by beholder, I mean the audio director um, who is uh, looking to hire or the, the developer who's looking to hire. Um, my personal opinion is that sound redesigns have a lot of value. And I think that they show a lot. They, they allow you to showcase creativity. Uh, they allow you to kind of riff and play. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think there's value in seeing that. Like I have redesigns on my website just because I did them and I thought they were fun. Um, I, I think that you have to walk a little bit carefully if you're thinking about that from a, a job application standpoint only for a few things. And one is how well known is the property you're redesigning? What is the chance that anyone who's going to be looking at it and hiring you for it worked on that game? I was going to bring that up. Because this industry is very small, very, very yeah. tiny. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think that uh, when I do that, my approach is usually like, I have, I have a goal in mind. I'm trying to say something with this redesign. It's, a, it's, it's like, it's like uh, Marvel What If, you know? Like, what if The Last of Us wasn't quite so scary? Or what if... <laughs> What if Stardew Valley, you know, one of them was secretly a murderer? And, you know, it's like, uh, when, you, when you start to do that, that, that drops a lot of blast shields for people. And people will be like, oh, there is a goal in mind. This isn't just designing it to sound better, because whoever did the original sound, even if you didn't like it, guarantee they spent a lot more time on it than you did in your redesign. It's just facts. But if you go in and say, like, Here's, here's, the, here's the editorial angle I'm taking. Then you're just making a commentary with the sound design. You're not trying to purport that your sound design necessarily is better. It's just different, but it's different in this specific way. And if you do that, I think that uh, that shows that you're goal-oriented, you're focused, you're, you're you know, putting some, de some design in sound design. Um, and if... Uh, if I was trying to, if I was a hiring manager and I wanted to hire someone for a specific, more junior role, and it was reasonable that the people I might want to hire have no game experience, I'd have, and this is personal uh, opinion, I would have no problem looking at a reel full of uh, sound redesigns because that's how you can show off your, your chops. Uh, I think what is ultimately going to be more valuable is downloading unreal or unity grabbing a whole bunch of free stuff off of the marketplace and building a super simple test level where you don't have to make a game just make a test level and you just wander around in it and fill that with sound that's your own oh wow is that going to move the needle a lot more i think than a than a redesign and it can be super fun um it's more more time investment of course um, and if you want to do something kind of bold and cinematic, a sound design is probably a better format for that kind of, for that kind of thing. If you haven't done that kind of work before, but I think, um, just spinning up your own test levels and really focusing on getting some sounds integrated and working, uh, that just shows a different level of competency. Um, even if, uh, even if it's, you know, rough around the edges, because you're not trying to impress anyone with lighting or scenery, you're trying to impress someone with sound. Yeah, those things I know style is tricky and I'm still as a sound designer struggling slash working on that, you know, because it's uh, it's it's interesting to to try and refine my approach to 
to keep the style consistent because it's one thing to get the sound so that it kind of works but then it's an extra level to try to get it so that it you know like works within a specific style and so it's like it's sort of that iteration process i find that there's a lot of sounds in you know the eco the game i'm currently working on i'm the audio director for and there's a lot of work that needs to get to, to pull things together because there's so many sounds and it's it's a combination of like you know i start out with the basics of like fidelity and like you know basically like the the just transferring information so it's just like yeah the sound you know means that you don't have to look at this part of the screen because it's an acknowledgement you know ui stuff mm -hmm. or like you know the footsteps you understand how fast you're moving what you're moving through those kind of things so that can be tricky and that's something i i help people a little bit with at the school not so much but uh, a lot of it is just the technical stuff of just getting it sort of you know working at the beginning and sort of the the add-ons that we have i help a little bit more with the, say like the design slash aesthetics there um, but with any reel i think uh it's very important to have some sort of sense of story so that you have like there's a start and the, this just comes down to basically it's like story or like composition it's like basically design with rela relationship to time as the scope goes from the start to the end so that there's a transition of just like okay that made sense and uh right. even if it's just like a you know like a a tech demo which some of the you know audio <laughs> you know like uh demos that uh, some of the students do is but it's still nice to have to at least show a little bit of your personality and show that you are a creative person within that small time frame if you can kind of cram it in there totally agree and yeah i think it's rails are about s storytelling and that they're telling your story um yeah. as a as a artist and as a creative person but um i think you know once again it's a design problem uh one of the things that i do is uh when i have reels i don't focus on reels i focus on clips then every reel I ever send is a custom collection of clips for that viewer. Yeah. And so, you know, for that reason, doing sound redesigns is fantastic. You're just putting more arrows in your quiver, but you've got to pick the right arrows to hit certain targets. That was a horrible metaphor, but uh, the <laughs> um, laser arrows. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's it's important to rem to always just keep in mind, like, who are you trying to uh, reach? Who yeah. are you communicating with? What is it you're trying to communicate? And, like, everything falls out of that. And just come up with design principles for your reel per application. And just, you know, tick off the boxes as to, like, oh, you know, I, I really love this thing I did. I know that the audio director worked on that game. So... For just that one purpose, maybe I'll pull that one out and put something else in. So the more modular you can make your real, uh, your real makings, um, I think there, there's a big benefit to that. Yeah, no, that's that's a great answer. I like the idea of, you know, showing something that's custom because it shows your audience that you care, that you care about their time. You specifically curated your, you know, what sides that you want to present to them and you spent the time to to understand like who they are and where they're sort of and how you're going to meet in the middle which is the core of what would be happening if you get hired yep. <laughs> so no that's that's huge uh so yes we've got uh basically like a couple minutes left to, to the top of the hour which is fine we will continue there will be more discussion but i'm just saying for people that are in youtube land i'm pointing there to my youtube screen uh continue to ask questions please i have more questions of course for for nathan as well but these questions have been really great and we'll just basically you know continue through these for the next little while here so just saying if you have to leave it sort of you know at the top of the hour Thank you for joining <laughs> but for the rest of us that are sort of you know interested in sort of hanging on a little bit longer we'll uh, we'll continue to to work through a few more questions so cool um let's see here da, da, da. oh this one's a tricky one so do you feel <laughs> that you have a good work-life balance as a sound designer working in games i have to go thanks for the time everybody oh, wait, wait, no <laughs> I, I, I would, I wish my, my self-assessment of that is probably better than my reality of that. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I, I go through phases like everybody, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I too 
for better and worse, wrap up a lot of my personal self-worth into my work product and what I do. And, uh, and that's because I, I care. It's because I have pride in what I do. Um, but, uh, you know, some months it swings wide either way. You know, some months I just realize that like maybe my health isn't where I want it to be. And so I want to go put in my time, be super productive during that time. But then when the clock strikes and that's a full work day, everything gets shut down and I got to go do something else. Um, it could also be that I'm in a state flow and I don't want to stop. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, to say state flow, flow state. Yep. Um, state flow diagram. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in a state of flow and I don't want to stop. And yeah. I want to just kind of ride that wave because we all know that, you know, none of us know where inspiration comes from, but when it strikes, we got to like hang on and write it while we have it. Cause it's not going to last. Um, and so, uh, as you can tell, uh, by the room I'm in, I have a lot of hobbies, which unfortunately are all also audio related. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but to me, the mindset of sound design is very different than the mindset of music is different yes. than the mindset yeah. of, of dialogue editing. Um, and so for me, uh, having, having those things kind of helps with, uh, at least enough context shift that I don't feel like I'm just grinding on, you know, 14 hours a day of dialogue implementation, which I've done. <laughs> yeah. I've been there <laughs> you know? too. Um, so I, I think a big part of it, and I, this is something that we all ignore when we're younger, but when you get older, listen to your body. You are not yeah. a Futurama brain in a jar on a robot body, um, you know, and when you start to get older and you get sick, even sitting at home and playing a video game is hard, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and so, uh, much less doing something creative because you can't go to work. And so I, I think my my big thing and my big lesson has been like, listen to your body, what your body is telling you, take as many breaks as you need to and as you can. And, um, if you wind up burning out, you're useless to, you're useless. You're of no good to anybody on a team and you're going to be harming the product you're working on. If you are not, you know, coming in with a fresh perspective as often as you can. Um, that's not always possible because unfortunately crunch sometimes still happens and stuff like that. But, uh, as much as you can, like it's, it's about coming in fresh and having the objectivity on what you did yesterday having the the clarity of thought to be like what i did yesterday sucks i'm gonna i'm actually gonna go into source control rip it all out <laughs> and replace it with something new yeah. even even though like i should technically be done with that task like you got to have the objectivity and if you're just grinding and you're like okay i did the task and you know irrespective of whether it was good or not you know check it off in jira go to the next task like yeah. that's not really benefiting uh the the team and product as a whole and the thing that i found when i fall into that sort of like uh death march you know is that it comes through in the product and when you listen back to it not just you but other people will listen back even if it's sound design i found it's maybe it's a bit more transparent with say music but you know, for those creative disciplines, it, it gets your vibe gets distilled into the product. And, you know, there are definitely instances of, yeah, if you push so hard and you're, you know, you might have a plus on like, yes, I, you know, I got to a new, whatever sort of creative level, but I also remember how unenjoyable it was you might find that it's just hard to go back to. And I, I do mm -hmm. similarly try to be truthful to myself in the moment and just go like, yep, yeah, this, I just need to take a break and I'll come back to it. And uh, it's, it can be difficult, especially when you're starting out because, you know, you think that mm -hmm. everybody's like, oh, we're all on a team and everybody's, you know, got to run with the wolves and like do this and that. And totally. it's, it's finally, you know, gotten a little bit more to the uh, balance of where, People are like, you know, just as a team, they're just pushing back and going like, hey, you know, we just know that we'll do better work if we do it this way. And we'd like to do mm -hmm. that. And if that's a problem, well, 
we might not necessarily be here. And that actually mm -hmm. brings up uh, sort of obliquely kind of like the idea, not that unions are always for protection, but like, yeah, we were talking yesterday just a little bit about the idea of like, you know, um, you know, how maybe unions and within either games or with audio could influence this either work-life balance or like, you know, how much you get paid or like, you know, sort of your titles and those kind of things. So I'm wondering if you could comment a bit on like sort of how you've uh, sort of experienced sort of like, you know, unions through your career and how that sort of, you know, influenced your working style maybe. Yeah. Um. Uh. Before we go into that, I think that my last word on work-life balance is yes. just simply that no one is going to do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. And one of the reasons why this is such a constant topic is that everyone's levels of work-life balance are different. Yeah. And they want them to be different. They should be different. And they change as you get older. They change as your life changes. And so my last word on that is like, defend what that balance is for you because no one else will do it for you. Uh, so, the um yep. so i i think that unions have an important critical place in our capitalist working society um and i think that we're starting to see uh uh certainly a, a wave in the the service industry right now at least in the united states um of uh you know coffee shops unionizing and stuff like that and uh, certainly there's been a handful of game studios that have that have unionized as well and um i mean just if you just look even just at the dictionary definition of some of the value benefits that unions can provide one of the biggest ones is collective bargaining yeah so if everyone starts to feel like things are kind of not benefiting the employees in a way that should happen or that seems equitable then the employees as a group through the union have a discussion, not just a bunch of individual people or a small department having a series of discussions. Um, and uh, one thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't think about initially with unions is that unions often lock in and negotiate rates for what you'll be paid. Yeah. And while that might seem uh, like a limitation, uh, that also means that you would potentially get compensated for extra hours put in. And um, I, this has not been my experience, but I think that um, there's, a, there's an argument to be made that financial penalties, meaning paying overtime, you know, time and a half, double overtime, whatever the case may be, um, based on the pay scale, um, is a financial incentive to not crunch. Um, so, um, I think, I think that there is the, the, the book on unions in the game audio world is still barely been written. I think we're, yeah. we're I think we're in the prologue or the introduction in that <laughs> book right now. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, unions have a, have a huge amount of value. Um, I think unions also have problems because yeah. every organization, more than three people, <laughs> more yes. than one person has problems. Um, <laughs> and you know, but game audio is not like the sanitation workers of new jersey right like this is right. where it's uh it's it's a much less kind of it's a much wider hat kind of <laughs> uh yep. uh style of union um but i i think they have value i think that people should look into it and read up about it and not every organization will benefit from having unionized workers yeah just yeah. it's it's not a thing that should be universal um, but for those uh, maybe larger scale companies, uh, I think there could be benefits. Um, going from ununionized to unionized is a whole thing. And yeah. making sure that bad blood doesn't happen during that transition is, I think, what most people are really scared of. Um, because it can be handled very well or handled poorly. Um, so, I don't know. I, I think they have a lot of benefits. And uh, uh, certainly they're very, very common in the broader entertainment industry outside of games. Um, that's kind of it's the norm um so it'll be inter interesting to see how the uh industry uh does or doesn't uh adjust or adopt to more unionized labor uh in in the future yeah 
Yeah, to me, I think that there's uh, things that happen online, you know, like salary transparency and stuff like that that can be helpful for, you know, people coming in, but then also people mid-career, top career or whatever, <laughs> you know, more advanced and stuff like that. And it and it is interesting uh, to have a little bit more, you know, basically like uh, help and, uh, you know, I guess you'd say uh, just sort of solidarity. I guess it's sort of a union issue type word, but like basically connect with people. <laughs> it's, on it that. is the union word. <laughs> yes, fair enough. It absolutely, it absolutely <laughs> is. Know. And yeah. and like here in the here in the U.S., like if you're a freelancer, mm -hmm. um, it's it's one of the very very few ways to actually get uh, significantly uh, uh, radically affordable health care and uh, even uh, potentially a pension. Yeah. Which like if you're just a freelancer working solo, like that's that's not a thing here in the United yeah. States, unfortunately. Um so there there are some other kind of just kind of almost HR style benefits. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I wanted to sort of bring that uh, in there because it's it's just an interesting topic that like you say, it's just sort of like starting to sort of gain yeah. A little bit more visibility these days uh there's a question yeah. about uh how do you stay up to date with rapidly changing technology mm. used in sound design game dev what skills do you try to practice outside of work hmm. when i was in college i think the number one thing the number one thing that college taught me was actually not what i got my major in but it taught me how to study yeah you know what i mean yeah, I do. And I and, and and I think that working in the in uh, any sort of technology industry, there is a a similar skill that you need to build, and it's a it's like a muscle, it's a habit of just trying to stay on top of things in almost like an ambient way. Uh, so that means you know subscribing to certain social media channels, uh, joining certain communities, uh, like um, you know public Slack channels, public Discord channels and um and just listen <laughs> just yeah. really you know pay attention and if if you happen to be working on a game that i don't know is wise and unreal uh or maybe it's wise in unity um you know just let your ears perk up a little bit when some when you see something like on a sound effect about like how team x totally misused wise to do this really interesting thing <laughs> like ooh, yes. yeah. abuse of a tool that sounds <laughs> bizarre and fun like what's that about and even if you wind up uh, I, I think a lot of it just becomes like this uh building this super set of possibilities in your mind where you may not you don't need to learn how every single tip and technique and and uh, uh post-mortem goes down but you should retain enough high level that you can start to recognize oh on my project i remember Team X on game Y was talking about this like two years ago. But, oh, what was, let me find that article. How did they solve the problem? And then bring that back to your team. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's a habit. Um, it's just like reading a, reading a newspaper in the morning, um, you know, and, uh, and also surrounding yourself with other people who are also curious about these topics and have them and basically have everyone kind of networking with each other and sharing news stories and info and behind the scenes and um and stuff like that yeah yeah with the school we try to do a little bit of that with the discord and thanks again for being an active member it's awesome um there's also the air wiggles which is sort of a new you know sort of game audio forum over in the uk that's coming together because twitter seems to be eh, maybe it's sunsetting a little bit we'll see what happens it's it's, fine. it's having some yeah. challenges yeah it's, having it's some challenges. Uh, yeah it's it's doing its thing so um <laughs> there's you know and there's obviously depending on the domain that you're in there's many many different other sort of ways to sort of cut this and like as far as bringing in materials that's something that i'm constantly curious about and it's nice that i <laughs> can basically use the school as an excuse to sort of be like you know scrolling around and being like oh my gosh that's a interesting like video on this or that and uh it's nice to be able to, you know, uh, spread the spread the knowledge and, and help people out when they're like there was, you know, on, on Discord, there was a person that asked like, oh, hey, how do I get like, you know, the sound source to sort of, you know, stay outside when I go into an interior area, like, you know, sort of the reverberant space. And I'm like, you should look at like, you know, Bill's video. And then he did. And he's just like, yeah, I just did the thing like, you know, like they had in their video. So it's neat. Yeah 
it's, you know, I think a large part of life is making those connections. And for me, sometimes I use the, yeah, the excuse of sort of, you know, like working with the school and working on games to, to, to connect like that. Cause I think it's a, it's a neat way to, yeah, basically bring people together. And it's, and it's fun when things sort of click together. And I think we've also hit upon like another really important question to ask in interviews. Like how does, how does your team stay abreast of stuff like this? Do you share cool links via Slack? Is there a specific channel for that kind of stuff? Is it an email alias? And like, that can tell you a lot about the workplace culture uh, or workplace ethos uh, based on, on their answer to that. Yeah, totally. I guess um question being, do you work remotely or do you work in house? Hmm. I work remotely. Um, yep. So I, I think one of the, you know, I, having worked in the technology industry for a long time, like remote work isn't like a new thing, but yeah. it's, it, it became a new thing for a lot of people during the pandemic, obviously. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have a acoustically treated studio and, um, you know, a fair amount of tools at my disposal, which is great. Um, and uh, I think that just the reality is um, if you are, if yet another interview question, if you are looking at, uh, <laughs> at, at a uh, remote role, ask how, um, how team bonds are retained, ask how they do that. Um, because it can, it can definitely be very isolating um, if you don't feel plugged in and connected with, with everyone. Um, because, you know, a, a lot of people, I think are gravitating towards things like public discords and public slack because they don't have a water cooler to stand around with uh their colleagues uh yeah. anymore because so many people are working remotely like me and so being able to kind of just have that that avenue just to just kind of like walk by with a cup of coffee and say what's up yeah you know what's what's new what's interesting i, I think that's that's a really important uh social aspect to uh working from home making copies <laughs> <laughs> good reference i i, I understood yeah. that reference <laughs> gotcha <laughs> yeah yeah water cooler talk is important and you know those sort of you know in the whatever version point two point oh of that is kind of like collision blah 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 and collision spaces and how to generate that either in physical spaces or like online spaces and uh yeah you know these are things that you know as we work in the industry and remotely you know we just gotta figure out things that work for us i find that i do like to connect with people on social media but i also really i like you know getting in depth with folks and i'm good with sort of one-on-one -on -one stuff and long answer kind of like you know scenario stuff i'm not as good as sort of doing the back and forth i'm not a big phone person you know those kind of things like yeah it's uh it's right I... yeah one of my one of my requirements is that there's basically like a meme channel <laughs> open at all times where people just <laughs> post silly stuff, you know, and it's like yeah. that's how you could be like this person in the lighting department has an amazing sense of humor, you know, and like that just something really funny could open up like a DM and just say like what well, you just posted was hilarious. Just wanted to thank you for brightening my day. And then, you know, that's a new relationship potentially, you know, to, you know, to cross, you know, cross discipline boundaries and stuff like that and so if 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 there isn't like a hashtag random channel <laughs> or <laughs> hashtag meme channel i'm not interested <laughs> yeah cool well what we'll do is we'll do one question here i got a couple more questions for you and then we'll we'll wrap uh, okay. but the the question from the audience here is asking if you could have learned one audio skill earlier what would it have been and do you feel like it might have had an impact on where you are right now Hmm. That's a great question. That's a great question. <sighs> hmm. I'm not coming up with answers. I'm sorting through the 12 answers I already have in my head. <laughs> um, uh, I think for me, there are two. Uh, I was really good with like sight reading and sheet music and stuff when I was a kid and I let that go. And I kind of wish I didn't. I, I wish I had kind of kept more kind of music theory going, even though I'm not a professional media composer. Um, uh, but I do mix and I master and I do music implementation. And so like, I would have found that to have been a, a nice thing to have kept up with. Um, I'm kind of coming back to it now, but 
my mind is not as elastic as it used to be. Um, <laughs> and uh, the other thing is something I also learned really early then went away from is not sound design, but mixing. Yeah. Uh, because you, you will have to mix individual layers to make a sound. You'll have to mix individual sounds to make a submix. And then you're going to have to mix the submixes in order to make the final mix. And so like mixing is something we do all day long. And so uh, mixing in terms of like, uh, I mean, mixing starts with gain staging, right? Like gain staging has to be dial tone for anyone working in this industry, I think. Um, and then from there, it's knowing the tools of the trade in terms of mixing, understanding how uh, dynamic mixing can be to draw attention over time to, to certain elements. And I think, I think uh, even if you're just making content or assets, I think that mixing is, uh, is a skill that we don't actually talk about explicitly as much as we do like sound sculpting and plug-in chains and compression. And of course, compression is part of mixing, but um, I think just as, a, as, a, as an art form, unto itself i think that's a that's a really critical one yeah yeah mixing is something that i similarly i'm trying to polish for <laughs> my side of things and i think that uh when i was younger mixing was like an additive thing where it's just like i gotta do all the things i gotta make them all work whereas now as i've gotten sort of maybe a little bit more advanced it's more like okay how much stuff can i throw away before this thing collapses and, and mm -hmm. so for me, I've found that to be uh, an interesting sort of uh, progression. It's sort of similar to like the resume. It's just like, you know, when you're starting out, it's like five pages long. And now it's like, you know, it's just sort of like one page. And then like, hey, if you want to ask me questions about stuff, you know, feel free. So it's. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think anyone who's a gamer, find a game that you liked playing and then go back to a checkpoint that you know pretty well. And, you know, just listen to the music, uh, just listen to the sound effects, just listen to the dialogue and mute everything else if the game yep. controls allow it. And that's that's a great way to study, um, study how it's how it's actually done on real games. Yeah. So I guess my final question will be basically to help out people that are, you know, on the freelance side of things, because, you know, like you say, you're working remotely. And if you could give, you know, like a little bit of uh, sort of, you know, whatever tips as far as sort of uh, I'm the, that whole process of like not being in the studio, working remotely and just sort of, you know, either the business side or the creative side or, you know, the communication side. I'm interested to hear how you would sort of, you know, sort of impart something that could help somebody that's like, yeah, I really want to do the freelance game audio thing. Uh, you have to be comfortable doing all of your own business development because mm -hmm. no one's going to do that for you. You have to find the clients. You have to market yourself. You are going to be wearing 12 different hats doing that, and you have to be okay with it. Uh, that's a nice hat, by the way. Um, Cheers. <laughs> and uh, you also have to radically over-communicate at all times. Right. When you think that you're being annoying, you're probably just about right in terms of... Uh, Chronic over communication, I think, is is a is a good thing for a freelancer. You always have to under promise and over deliver, but that has to do also if you're in house as well. Um, as much as possible, unless you can get extra money for it, uh, designate a single point of contact for all feedback. Um, and you know the the high road to take there is if there that well the reason you do that is to make sure that if there are disagreements create creatively those get resolved in house yeah before being dropped yeah. in your lap and if they can't <laughs> come to consensus that's when they should rope you in and say we can't come to consensus let's have a discussion great that's fine um it goes with my sixth point which is uh you will always do some degree of client therapy right um you you will be a therapist for your clients it's unavoidable it happens and Frankly, that's a value add. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I say that somewhat uh, flippantly, but I actually really do mean it. Like you are someone who is not in house with the day-to-day -day grind and politics and people might need to vent at you or people might need want your opinion because you're an objective outside perspective. And that's fine. That's, that's the value that you can help add. And 
helps you become a better member of, uh, of the team at large. Um, and then just, uh, you, you gotta be comfortable with getting paid. Mm -hmm. You gotta be, you, you gotta be a bulldog getting paid. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got as a freelancer was hire people to do the things that aren't going to make you money. Because if you're a freelancer, you yeah. are going to be billing either fixed fee or hourly. And if every minute or every hour you're spending doing accounts payable or accounts receivable, you're not earning money. You're spending your own money. It's a loss of revenue. So getting a lawyer, you don't have to have them on retainer. Lawyer, lawyers in general over the year are not that expensive. But get a, a lawyer who can look at contracts uh, and intercede on your behalf if necessary. Get an accountant or a bookkeeper. That's probably good to start. Good to start. And then you start, then you start kind of realizing that, like, yes, I'm a freelancer. I am a person creating creative work independently. But you do that by assembling a team around you to support you. Just like an, a composer has got a whole team of orchestrators and copyists and IT folks and all this other stuff. So. Just because you're a freelancer doesn't mean you have to do everything yourself. Um, and it's hard to, to get the money and then pay back out to somebody else. But uh, it's really important for uh, really adopting a freelance lifestyle and start really you're starting your own business. And you have to take that with the seriousness that it requires. Yeah. Wow, that's great. I feel like we did a little speed round there at the end. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So I think what we'll do is that we'll wrap there and thank you so much for everybody that's joined us live and asked great questions. And uh, of course, thanks, Nathan. This has been really super fun. And of course, we could continue talking, but there's, you know, <laughs> there's other things to do too. And uh, yeah, these yeah. sounds are going to implement themselves <laughs> as much as I, what, where's the AI when we need them? Implement the sounds. <laughs> Damn it. Exactly. I got other stuff I want to do. That's right. We gotta throw Dolly on there. The, what is it? Riff. Riff. There's one that's a riff one. Anyways, uh, yeah. So many audio AI <laughs> things going on. And but that. Anyways. Yeah. I, I won't comment on that because that's a whole other you know half an hour of discussion. So we'll just wrap there and say that yes. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan, for joining us. My name is Leonard Paul. I run the School of Video Game Audio. You can you know, whatever, check us out online, SOVGA.com. And yeah, Nathan, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, they can find me at my website, which is noisejockey.net. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Hive uh, as noisejockey. And uh, I'm also uh, Nathan Moody on Instagram. Perfect. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, ciao.